Hey there. Um, welcome to my uh, wrap up. I don't know. What, what are we calling this? I'm featuring um, all of the games that I've played this year. Um, basically, my my 10 like favorites uh, that I played this year uh, that came out this year. And I'm also going to talk about uh, a bunch of games that didn't come out this year, but I, I discovered or I played through this year that I really enjoyed. And then I've got some honorable mentions. So uh, they, these are not in really any order. They're just 10 games I uh, I kind of picked. I've tried to keep um, within certain genres. So if I like liked two games of the same genre, then I had to kind of like be picky choosy about it. I played a lot of games this year and I really wanted to like basically just, you know, list games that I really enjoyed and uh, I didn't want to overcomplicate this or do a bunch of editing on it because then it would just not happen. So um, please forgive this uh, very like a slapdash uh, presentation. So here we go. We're just going to I'm just going to jump into it. Here we go. Uh, my button, my button didn't work. I, I did a lot of work to make sure that button was going to work. All right, well, the first one I'm going to list. And uh, by the way, uh, these are my top 10 that don't include Elden Ring or Vampire Survivors because everyone's going to put that on their list. And I'm sure you're sick and tired of hearing of Elden Ring and Vampire Survivors. They they are very great. Uh, you know, I absolutely go and go and check those games out. But you've probably heard about them 100 times. So anyway, here's Gunlocked. Uh, Gunlocked was um, like it came out on the on the tales of vampire survivors a little bit and it's definitely in the same genre whatever we're deciding we're calling that genre but i i really enjoyed it um i actually enjoyed it more than vampire survivors in a lot of ways and uh i ended up playing it for a lot longer than vampire survivors um it's it's kind of the same format but in an arcadey shooter and uh, i really enjoyed that and the format worked well there was some really cool power-ups and uh, I, I like the graphics. I like I like everything about Gunlocked. Honestly, there isn't much. There there was wasn't even like a, a single nitpick I could think of that uh, that really like held back Gunlocked. There's a lot of replayability. You can add challenges to your your playthroughs that added a lot of um, variety. And uh, I just really like the power ups, and I really like the the, um, the the gameplay loop. It was really good. Oh God, that's slow. Why Why is my presentation just the worst? Also, yes, I did grab all these pictures off Google. Don't hate me. Sorry, sorry. This is like rock and stick primitive tech. Give me one second here. All right, hopefully next time I do this, it'll be a lot, <laughs> a lot more professional. Anyway, Cosmoteer. Um, Cosmoteer ended up being a game I, I put a lot of hours into. Um, it was, it really came out of left field. I didn't really hear too much about it. Um, I knew it was a thing, but I didn't really like look much into it until it came out. And uh, I was, uh, I, I was really privileged to to get a key from the dev, and I really appreciated that. But um, Cosmo Tier ended up being one of my favorites this year in terms of like a uh, an actual like space sim sandbox, which I really do like um, space and uh, space sim sandboxes, but they tend to like, I love the idea of them more than I actually end up enjoying the gameplay. There's something about the space sim where um, they tend to be over designed and there's a lot of tropes that have to be kind of fulfilled when it comes to space sims. And Cosmo Tier, I really enjoyed because it kind of, um, it, though it did fulfill some of the very basic necessities of a space sim. It also went out of its way to just be a really enjoyable and fun game, um, kind of combining the space sim with some col colony sim features, although they are so light that um, I'm mean, sure even mentioning that will will upset some people. But like, you know, it's it had uh, it had that kind of like micromanagement of uh, making sure that all of your like automation of, of people on your ship was uh, was balanced, was efficient, was optimized. Uh, but then it also had like a lot of the really fun kind of um, you know grinding and uh, exploration and uh, combat in the in the actual like sandbox mode. And it has had some really good quests. It has some really nice graphics. Um, the graphics I know like. You know, they're primitive, but they, they work really well and they're very slick. And I, I like had endless enjoyment out of Cosmoteer in multiplayer, no less. Like it was working kind of day one with multiplayer. A couple of glitches here and there, but I mean, it's an early access. So, you know, what can you really expect? But I, I loved the heck out of Cosmoteer and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with it. So if, if I'm going to put an early access title on this list, this would be the one. Uh, Gunlock doesn't really count because it came out. <laughs>
War Tales. War Tales was such a cool game. I really didn't know what to make of War Tales, but I played it uh, during one of the next fests and like instantly fell in love. And then I got to uh, play it during the uh, uh, turn-based fest. But War Tales ended up uh, honestly contender for like game of the year, uh, you know, a uh, game of the year um, asterisks. But uh, yeah, War Tales was such a cool game. I think the closest I, thing I could like compare it to is Wildermyth in terms of like uh, a game that is really trying to create player driven narratives, like narratives that just kind of like um, come from nowhere or they, they, they kind of build up um, and, and offer like interesting obstacles or challenges for the player to overcome. It obviously has some um, pretty like D&D-ish influenced tactics, but I mean like I, I feel like um, there's so many tactics games that came out this year that all uh, borrowed from from this and that that it's it's kind of like moot to say it or it, it's kind of redundant to say that uh, you know it, it borrowed but like the the tactics are really fun like they don't slouch on on that like the actual combat portion um it doesn't feel like it's an afterthought but um i just like really enjoy uh some I just uh, really enjoy some of the like built-in situations that War Tales kind of creates for the player, like you know, all characters earning certain traits from certain things happening, or earning certain titles because they they accomplish certain goals, uh, forming relationships. I love. Uh, I, I kind of. I, I like. I think a nitpick, like one nitpick about War Tales, is I hope they either commit to mini games or they don't. But like I'd either love to see mini games for like all of the professions like cooking and scholar and bard and stuff like that, um, b rather than like some mini games. But I do really like the mini games. Um, they 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 don't kind of like they're just there for a little bit of flavor and they don't really get uh, to be too tedious or in the way. Um, I love the world of War Tales, and I also like how in War Tales, like your career or your like long-term campaign story isn't kind of shoved in your face. Uh, you're you're mostly free to roam around and do what you want, and then the the actual like story is something that like is earned over time, which makes me like a lot more invested. It feels like I had to earn the actual story of the game rather than just like, oh yes, you're in, you jump in and you're the hero, you're the main protag and you gotta go stop the dragon. And it just doesn't feel very, uh, it, it, like it's kind of like if everything is special, then nothing is like, it feels like you don't, you never have to kind of earn the, the gifts that are like thrusted upon you in, in a lot of RPGs. War Tales just kind of strikes the perfect balance and I, I really can't wait to see what more they, they shove in there. Um, I'm looking, I, I'm actually looking forward to trying the game in co-op, which they, they've they recently updated the game with. But yeah, contender for, for game of the year for me. Vault of the Void is um, my uh, my pick for card game. Um, I've, I've got I've got inscription on here as a, uh, as a honorable mention, but I think that Vault of the Void is a game, um, like in terms of like an actual, you know, like a game with very good card, uh, card gameplay, like card based gameplay, um, deck building gameplay. I think that Vault of the Void just kind of ran away with it. It's a game I, I keep coming back to and it's, it's, it just like did everything it could to completely shake up the format because I feel like, um, you know, once everyone agreed that deck building as a genre was was good was something that we wanted more of we wanted more deck building games everyone that wanted to make a deck building game kind of just i, I i'm not gonna say they just like copy slay the spire or or uh, you know dominion but they, they looked at slay the spire and dominion and said okay this is the format and this is what we're going to build upon and we're going to innovate in exactly this amount of margin um and i really respect and appreciate vault of the void for looking at that format and saying no we're gonna break every single rule in the book here uh we're gonna make it you know, we're not gonna make um taking cards out of your deck a reward we're gonna let the player do that themselves uh we're not going to like you know their the cards are earned in a like a very kind of specific way in vault of the void that um don't just like follow every single format doesn't just like do slay the spire again and i really appreciate that i appreciate how you make 
choices in this game. It doesn't feel uh, like like just kind of following the same path in uh, for, in every single deck building game. Um, Vault of the Void has some really deep um, uh, like actual um, uh, strategies for for building your decks for playing cards um, it's actually quite challenging but it's not so challenging like I do feel like a lot of these deck building games just kind of go for it in terms of making a ridiculously difficult game like you have to basically break uh, break you know make build a, a deck so ridiculously powerful that it can just break the game over your knee every single game uh, vault of the void I think draws a bit more of a compromise you do make some really strong decks but you also, uh, you know, you don't feel like you have to, you know, defeat God at the end of every single game. Um, though I will say I have only been playing on the normal mode, so maybe in the more challenging modes, maybe uh, maybe that's the case. But either way, I really enjoyed the um, the kind of uh, balance of, of difficulty that Vault of the Void drew, and I, I really appreciated it for that. Uh, Adaka is a game I think that, um, like, the people who discovered it love it a lot and the people I, I but i still think it's a game that people are going to sleep on a little bit um i think that maybe you'll get the wrong impression from it um when you when you first look at it um i it's definitely like it's got a lot of influences but the the very obvious influence is a uh, half like um or half life um i think that adaka is like my ideal half like or half life indie game like it's hard it's really hard to explain but um i kind of love how uh how primitive like the compromise that adaka makes when it comes to the graphics and the style that it strikes and i really enjoy the gameplay in adaka i like how it is like very obviously influenced by things like half life but it also um kind of does what it can to stray from the path um in, in certain ways and i also really appreciate that they just like threw in an entirely other game like it's a really weird one adaka is is a is a difficult one to even explain because it's on one side it's like yeah um if you're looking to fill that half-life itch which i know we all are um just just get adaka it's absolutely worth it but then also there's just like this extra extraction shooter in there just thrown in there which i i find to be so strange like I, I i said this in my let's try but like the dev absolutely could have just split this up into two different games and charged 20 for each but instead threw them both into one game and charged 30. so like either way uh i think they're they're both really amazing games and uh i just i just love that world it, it actually looks really cool i know it's got kind of a, a low fidelity look but I am the post processing like added on top um, and like the actual atmosphere of the game is like just excellent. The gunplay is really fun. There's a lot of variety in the weaponry, and uh, you know it's it just it just is Half Life again. You know like not again. I mean obviously this is a different campaign, but it really does scratch that itch, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I, I I'm looking forward to honestly playing more of it. It, uh, it stole quite a few of my hours. So, like, here's the thing, right? I see a lot of top 10 lists of 2022, and it feels to me like people are just kind of avoiding Dwarf Fortress. Um, so this one's almost done as a response. Like, I, it's sort of like, you know, I know Elden Ring and I know Vampire Survivors, um, but it's sort of like when, you know, like Lord of the Rings comes out and you, you give an Oscar to something else, like anything else. It's it's just like, if you can talk about Dwarf Fortress, I think that you probably should. I think Dwarf Fortress is such a ubiquitous game and maybe you're tired of hearing about it. Maybe you've heard about it enough. And I mean, especially recently, since it's a lot more accessible, it's basically hit the mainstream, but at the same time i think that this is such an important game um it has it has so many roots in so many of the things that we enjoy today that i think that if you're given an opportunity to put door fortress on any list it should be there it's just one of our I, I think it's one of the most important games i say important because it's just like yeah it's a fun game to play but also you know this this game shaped not just like one genre but many like 
If we didn't have Door Fortress, we wouldn't have Minecraft. If we didn't have Fort Door Fortress, we wouldn't have RimWorld. But like, also there's just so many games now that have, have Door Fortress roots that if you can talk about it, you should. Um, but also just the uh, monumental amount of effort and time that went into making this game more accessible and, and uh, you making it so that more people can enjoy it really deserves to be talked about. Never mind like the actual game, which is also just like uh, just a monolith of a game, but also just the time taken to making this game more accessible and some of the UI upgrades and some of the, the extra features and the tutorial. I know people have gripes with this tutorial and I know that people have gripes with the, the shortcuts, but it still deserves to be, uh, you know, like, uh, it really does deserve to be put on a pedestal. So I, I am really looking forward to being able to play this game. It's a game that I have enjoyed um, kind of uh, at a distance and now I'm able to actually enjoy it um, up close and personal. And I'm looking forward to doing much more streams and series with this game. And uh, I, you know, I can't, I can't honestly show enough love to this game. So, Door Fortress 2022. Who, who'd have thought, you know? Um, I so I love sock pop games, and I think Stacklands, um, it's it's definitely one of their more popular games. I think it's probably pro, uh, probably their most popular game, and I think there's a good reason for that. Um, I think that um, sock pop games. They, they do they they do a really good job of um, basically demanding the player figure their game out without much explanation and I think that stacklands is the perfect kind of environment for that it definitely demands that the player figure things out but because it's formatted in a very tactile way but since it's formatted in a uh, you know it's put in the con into the context of a uh, board game, a tabletop game, I think that there's a lot more conveyed to the player without uh, necessary explanation. And because we're using very like basic building blocks of creating, uh, uh, you know, a colony or creating a village, um, there, there's so much that is conveyed to the player that is, uh, it shortcuts a lot of tutorials. So I think that Stacklands is in a lot of ways Sock Pop's greatest achievement in terms of like, having to uh, convey an entire idea to a player without explaining it all that much. And Stacklands is, is amazing. It's, it's, one of, it's, it's one of the best games I've played. And in terms of like a, a, just like an experiment, I think it is, is such an achievement. And I will I, I definitely, I will probably be seeing um, Stackland likes in the future. I know there are things like, um, got a cult simulator or i can't remember what it's called but uh, uh those games were like a large miss for me um because they were so complicated when you put thing when you when you um phrase things in the context of like a very alien landscape and w with i think cult simulator it makes things a little bit harder to understand and it also makes things a little bit less relatable i like that Stacklands makes things very um like very close to home like you, you got your people and you need to feed them i mean it's it couldn't be much more simple than that you have your rocks and sticks and you put together a house and then you you know you can put a villager in the house and they make another village like it's it's just so intuitive and i, I think that that makes stack stacklands um really easy to jump into and the fact that they've take they take that and they develop that idea or you're you've got like an entire board of cards and you've expanded things so much like the progression in Stacklands is so satisfying the stuff they've also uh updated it with like the island and the uh, the dark woods like I, i'm just playing through Darkwood, the Darkwood update now and it's like it seriously is an achievement the the um the fact that they were able to develop that idea without really ruining the balance um i think it's uh it's it's definitely worthy of you know being on on a 10 list Stacklands was, was seriously impressive. So Strange uh, Horticulture is not a game I played a lot of. I, I basically just covered it on my Let's Try, but I was very impressed with it. It's definitely one of those games that I will be um, playing through on a stream. It's one of those games that like it stayed with me like every once in a while I, I was thinking about it um, and thinking about like, you know, how uh, it took this very like 
interesting idea of running um, not quite a potion shop, but you know, like basically a, a, um, a pharmacy in a way and uh, made it so tactile like it, it is uh, it's an achievement in terms of like like when you think about what a game should be or like how you interact with a game how like basically it's UI it really comes down to I think that strange horticulture has one of the best UIs for a game because the UI itself is the experience is the gameplay um, and it, it's an interesting thing and it's one of those um, the, the one of those things that I think that a lot of games kind of uh, overlook uh, when you, it's like when you design a game or you design the interactions that a player uh, have with your game how the player interacts with your story how the player um, kind of figures things out progresses and uh, interacts with with your your toy box basically um it's you know it, it's one of those things that's strangely overlooked is like how are you how is your player holding things how is your player uh, looking at things how is your player uh you know discovering the storyline and the strange horticulture is a thing is a game that very much takes a hard look at ui and and how you interact with those things and tries to uh heighten all of those things tries to make each each way that you interact with the world interesting and compelling and i think it succeeds in that way and i'm i'm, I'm really looking forward to playing more of it um it's just one of those one of those games that you you are only going to get to play through once so it definitely deserves to be on this list um so if war sim is a really it's on the fence of like does, is this game did this game come out this year I, I certainly discovered it this year. Um, did it come out this year? Either way, um, if I'm gonna pick a year to say that War Sim deserves to be on a list, uh, it'll be this year, uh, just because it's it's War Sim. War Sim was such an awesome find. Um, I'm not like huge on 4X games. Like I'm just not very good at them. And that's good in a way. Like War Sim is a game. I think it's like it's barely even a 4x game, but it kind of is. It's it's sort of like Crusader Kings, um, put it put through like the ASCII um, generator. Like, I, I, it's such a weird game to explain, but it's got like city building um, mechanics. It's got story building mechanics. It's got. Um, like kind of player progression. It's got kingdom progression. Um, it's got built-in little micro stories, a little little uh, micro like weirdo characters. Um, it's got little um, kind of like side stories or or short stories that you can develop over time. It's kind of like it really is. A, it's it's just its own universe. Um, the developer has done such a great job of. Uh, like I don't know, making a very unpretentious world that for the player to explore. Like you are the ruler of your kingdom, but what does that mean? Like when you're when you're a king in uh, like say Crusader Kings or or in in any of your 4X games, uh, rarely does that mean that you interact with your people. Uh, and War, War Sim is a game that demands you do, demands that you know your people and know how uh, weird and stupid they are. Really, <laughs> like. Um, maybe they are incorrect for following you, but, uh, you know, follow you, they will into the dirt and, and War Sim is just one of those games. Like it's, it's one of those games that looks at like success and failure and how both of those things are valid forms of storytelling. And it really deserves to be, uh, it, it's one of those must play games. It's one of those games that people are going to pass up because, uh, of its like, very specific art style and i think that that is a shame i think it's one of those games that you should play because even though it does have that very kind of uh, old school ascii um, look and feel it is actually very intuitively played like i think that honestly anyone could pick up war sim and and figure it out pretty pretty easily um so it's it's actually a very accessible game um, but yeah, I hats off to the, the dev and, and congratulations on uh, on actually getting this thing off the ground and, and, and releasing it. I'm looking forward to playing more of it. I'm not sure if I want to do like a whole new series or or just like see some of the new content in uh, in my my playthrough where I left it off or I basically won. 
but uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I, I'm not sure yet. And uh, lastly, for like my my 10 list of games that I uh, came out this year and I was able to enjoy, I, I think Old World should be on here because like, I don't know. Again, I'm not into 4X games, um, but I think if a 4X game uh, compels me, is is able to pull me in and, and actually make me invested in its gameplay uh, and its in its complexity, um, then it deserves to to you know commendation for that commendation. I don't know. It, it, it deserves praise. That's really what I'm just saying. Um, and Old World absolutely did that. Uh, I love the compromises that Old World makes to kind of make its genre a bit more accessible for, for, for people like me. But I also like how it doesn't compromise its complexity. Um, Old World is a game that is, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's necessarily accessible um, because it is really deep and it is really uh, complex. But I definitely think that if, you know, like for a game to be super complex, uh, it, it does everything it can to also make itself understood. And I also appreciate like how many influences it takes from. Like if this game was just a straight by the book 4X game, I don't know if I would enjoy it as much, but the fact that it also takes influence from uh, Crusader Kings, I, the fact that it's also trying to create a compelling and interesting narrative and, and sort of draw from like the dynamics of a family tree and, and actually like kind of base some of its mechanics on not just you as a ruler, but you as uh, uh, like just like a web. You, it's not even just you, it's your, your kingdom is like a web of people. Makes it really compelling and makes it less about just conquering the world as uh, so many of these 4X games do uh, and and more about um you know like what who who are you and who is your family and and what does it all mean and and it's really it's really it's a really beautiful game and i really um i i wish i was smart enough to play more of it but i i am a smart enough to rec uh, recognize that it is a, an excellently made game that uh, that it deserves it des deserves some uh, praise so uh, those are my 10 games for this year. There's definitely, there was a lot of really cool games. Um, I mean, uh, you know, for instance, I, I would really love to put, uh, I, I actually, I don't know if this is in my honorable mentions, but I will put it there anyway, but um, well, we'll get there in a second. Let me, let me do, um, here's, let me see, six games that I played this year that didn't come out this year. So here we go. Um, Vintage Story isn't even really out yet, so I mean, like, you know, Early Access, how do you even talk about Early Access without, uh, you know, like, is it out this year? I don't know, and I don't care, really. Um, Vintage Story is a game I, uh, was introduced, um, this year and played quite a lot of, and I think it's fantastic. I, I honestly, like, you know, I, I know this is controversial, but given the choice between Vintage Story and Minecraft, I would pick Vintage Story every single time, without question, without without even thinking about it. Um, it's just so, it, it gets that kind of survival crafting sandbox game perfectly right. Um, there's a, enough darkness and enough kind of, you know, like kind of creepiness in it um, that that it, it, you know, it feels like something you are. You, there's there's things to actually survive against, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the gameplay. Um, the, the, the fact that you work through not just like a tech tree, but kind of an age tree, like you start from like a pottery age and work your way up to bronze and steel, uh, like that, that sense of progression is so stupidly satisfying in Vintage Story. Um, you have to really work for and earn everything. Even building a house in Vintage Story feels like an accomplishment. Um, and I think that's something that like was in Minecraft, but I think it's something that Vintage Story really takes a hard look at and it's just like, yes, um, you really have to earn your 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 constructions. You have to earn your resources. You have to earn your tools and your weaponry. And they, th because of that, they're gonna feel so much more valuable. It doesn't feel like a grind. It feels like you, you know, like, like the steps between progression are, are short, but the, the actual like, um, you know, I'd say the road between like zero and established is long. And that's what makes Vintage Story so satisfying. 
and uh yeah i love it i i want to play more of it i i did play quite a lot of it and, and got a little bit burnt out hence why my series stopped a little bit but um i, I definitely want to come back to it maybe even do like a multiplayer series would be kind of fun um wildermyth didn't come out this year i don't think but um it definitely deserves to be talked about uh wildermyth is a game i played with my friend peter and uh did a series on and it's just a really fantastic game it's a kind of like war tales in a lot of ways because it is that kind of drawing that connection between like tactics and also a little bit of D and and some role playing and some like kind of uh immersive storytelling where you know things happen uh to your characters and they have a long lasting impact and they actually have some kind of like stake like you know you you when things happen in Wildermyth, they're not taken for granted. You, uh, you know, they come up later. They actually create some kind of impact in the world, and uh, that makes them actually meaningful. Um, whereas in like a lot of RPGs, it's like, oh yeah, well, we, you know, we fought and killed the dragon of whatever, but you know, that was that was you know yesterday. Today we're on this like path to kill God or whatever, and and that's that's what we're on now, and that's what we're doing. Wildermyth doesn't take any of the stories for granted, doesn't take any of your achievements or defeats for granted, and uh, that's that's what makes it so compelling. Um, the, you know, stories are really only interesting if they if you know you can take them seriously, and that's never more true than in games like Wildermyth and War Tales, where the stories that you kind of created as a player are are actually like examined and acknowledged in the gameplay. And uh, that's that's definitely worth some praise. I I, I, I want to do more Wildermyth. I have so there's so many games that came out this year. It's like how you know the fact that I didn't put more time in Wildermyth is actually kind of a crime. Um, Fates of War. I don't. It didn't come out this year, but I believe it came out last year. And um, I think it's a game that's going to get slept on by a few people, but it's just such a fantastic little game. Um, it, it has some very obvious influences, but it absolutely just runs away from the established path. It, uh, it looks at things like maybe Diablo or Grim Dawn or, you know, those kind of CRPGs. Um, but then it, it like, you know, absolutely breaks some rules in, in very uh, impressive ways. It looks at things like, oh, casting spells should have like an actual tangible cost. It looks at things like, you know, um, like discovering how to 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 um, accomplish a quest, to to actually hand in a quest is, is being something a bit more um, difficult for the player and less handed to them. Like you really have to earn some of the quests in, in that game. And they have, uh, you know, there's there's some really like, interesting connections between some of the mini quests and the actual long term quest. Um, and, you know, it must be said, like, you know, I, I like the story in Fates of War, but I also just really enjoy the gameplay. The, the, the spells and the different abilities have such wild variety in, in Fates of Ort, and they they really like it hold they hold up they hold up so well they there's I think in some ways more creativity and more variety in Fates of Ort than a lot of the uh, a lot of CRPGs that I've played I'm not gonna say you know which ones whatever but like I haven't played all that many CRPGs but like I I, I just really admire and am impressed by the creativity in Fates of Ort it's a world that um you know I haven't seen a thousand times there's a little bit a little thin layer of irony um in Fates of Ort that make it makes it really charming um and some of the little stories are, are very memorable like you know I, I honestly think on some of the things that I did in Fates of Ort um more so than a lot of like big triple a uh RPGs really cool game Steamworld Heist is a game I played this year uh I played it all the way through it and on stream um and it's just really excellent i you know the story is is you know whatever i i i wouldn't say I, I dislike it or like it but i do appreciate that it has one and i do appreciate um how it tries to have a little bit of emphasis on drama um with your characters and, and what you're trying to accomplish i really like how um the devs of the steam world universe have like tried to kind of build on that universe in, in different ways and i have also i also appreciate how they just like decided they weren't going to be the the platforming company and steamworld heist 
was a really fun kind of uh, like uh you know um, straying from that path they were like no we can do other genres too and here's basically uh side scrolling xcom and it works really well i really really like uh steam world heist it's got some very uh like it's got some deep gameplay but it's also just like super accessible and and super um it's almost like a kind of a casual xcom which is good for me because i tend to be awful at those kind of kinds of games um, and I really enjoyed uh, some of the like built-in synergies and and some of the cool weaponry and the different kind of tactics and approaches you can take uh, to to solving some of the, the levels in, in Steam World Heist. Still a uh, difficult, like it is a challenging game, um, but I, I I think that it's not as challenging, and I uh, I actually really appreciate that. Um, but it is like ultimately, it's just got some really fun combat, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so this is Franbo and, and L Little Misfortune, um, were both games I played basically back to back. Um, they're a lot, they're very dark. I'm like, honestly, um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend them, uh, to anyone with, you know, a content warning. Like they, they are super dark games, um, but they are like super compelling and I'm really, uh, glad I didn't miss them because I, I almost passed them up. Like I, I, I grabbed them, but they almost ended up in my in backlog purgatory but uh franbo i mean they're very different games in a way but they're both dark in, in similar ways but franbo um is it basically like alice in wonderland if if wonderland was just like the worst place ever um not it not so much as a uh, the that i can't remember who, who made it but like the alice world where it's just like basically edgy for the sake of edgy in a lot of ways but franbo um it has it has a, like a very dark dark irony um and and um kind of a it's almost light spirited darkness like it's you know the main character is very much like uh you know they just kind of go with it um but at, at all times there's like definitely a sense of trauma and a, a, a sense of just like misery but uh, I, I enjoy it, and there's definitely a creative flair to Franbo that is hard to ignore. It's a game that's going to stay with me for a while, um, for better or worse in a lot of ways. But I, I still really I had a lot of admiration for, for Franbo and, and Little Misfortune. Very different narratives, very almost different style, but it still has that kind of like dark irony to them that, uh, you know, is, is very familiar. And I, I, I would recommend them both equally. Um, for different reasons, really, but you know they've both got that kind of point-and-click adventure vibe, so um, you know they're they're both worth it. Fight Night was a game I played last year. If I had done this whole like uh, end-of-year wrap-up, like top ten thing, uh, it would have been on that list. Uh, Fight Night was a game I was really looking forward to, and had the um, privilege of of meeting the creator during a convention and trying the game in its very early state. But uh, Fight Night is just fantastic. You know, basically um, Grim Rock uh, or Legend of Grim Rock or Eye of Beholder, if you like, but with like added over the top aggressive combat style and and it works so well doesn't compromise on like grim rock style uh puzzles there's actually it's almost maybe too puzzly um but I, I still ended up really enjoying it um and i i enjoy the puzzles and it's it really just does it makes no compromises in terms of in terms of that gameplay and um it's just got such such a creative style and it really like all of the characters the dialogue is just like excellent and it's got this very thick layer of irony and uh, kind of like self-awareness like it, it uh, it's definitely like this is a hundred percent like the hundredth game you've played in this style so we're going to just like we'll do some self-referential humor but we're also just going to be like super over the top in every regard and like every character you meet has has a has a charm and uh has a lot of character to them <laughs> The, I, I love the dialogue in Fight Night, but I also just like really love the gameplay. It's almost like, uh, you know, like our new modern Doom guy. If you if you stuck him in, uh, you know, Legend of Grimrock, that's kind of what Fight Night feels like a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it's excellent. It's just such a good game. I really enjoyed it end to end. Um, the last spell is a game I want to enjoy more of. I, this is a, this isn't really out yet. Um, these are, okay, so this is officially in my, uh, honorable mention. So, th though, I think the last spell did come out this year, 
it came out in early access, so it's not really finished yet. And that's really why I haven't played more of it yet. It's a, it's a game I, I feel like I want to come back to it after uh, it's closer to release. But it's a game I, I really do appreciate what they're trying to do with the last spell. They're definitely trying to shake shake up the kind of you know turn-based tactics format a little bit. Um, it's got a little bit of XCOM in it. It's got a little bit of kind of city and, and town building in it, just a little bit. Um, and it's also got a little bit of roguelite in it, um, though I, I, I'm not sure how much yet. Like that's one of those things I'm not, oh, I'm not yet super clear on, but it's a really cool game and I'm, I'm really looking forward to coming back to it when it's a bit more developed. But I can't, I couldn't, you know, it's a game I think about it. I can't deny that it has such a cool and original style to it. And it's also got a lot of really fun variety to its skills doing a lot of cool stuff that I'm like I'm, I'm like you're I hate to say it but it's got potential <laughs> you know like um it, it's got it's doing some really cool stuff with like you know it's various abilities and it's kind of like very dark universe um and uh I, I'm really looking forward to coming back to Last Bell and trying trying more of it uh, if I was going to pick two sand, sandbox kind of space sims, I, I went ahead and picked Cosmo Tier because I ended up enjoying it uh, you know, more or at least longer. Um, but Star, Star Valor was such a cool game and uh, it's it's really got its heart in the right place um, in terms of like just making um, like a kind of a, a by the book, like, you know, straight shooter space sim. Uh, Star Valor gets it right and it's got pretty much it's got all of the stuff you would want in a space sim It's got your space trading. It's got your exploration and the combat is there and it's good um, You've got variety in different ships and different guns and how you upgrade your ship and how you progress is all very satisfying um, I, I don't know honestly, I think I just appreciate that Cosmo tier does more to shake up the format um, which is why I ultimately ended up enjoying it more but I, I still really love and respect Star Valor and I, it deserves to be somewhere here. So uh, hence it's in my honorable mentions and uh, you know, uh, props to the, the, the dev for, for releasing this. This game is pretty monolithic. It's, it's quite a large game. Um, so I'm prob I might get some heat for not putting inscription on my top 10 or, or like 10 games of this year. Uh, I, I ultimately, I ended up putting it Vault of the Void on there instead. And I think it's because I think that Vault of the Void, um, it does more in some ways for the deck, for, for innovating deck building than, than Inscription does. Um, it, and I know that's weird to say, Inscription does a lot to innovate it for sure. Like it, it it's trying so many things and it succeeds in all of them. Like it is a really fantastic game deserves to be on the list. I guess I just um, appreciate that Vault of the Void it, it kind of takes the genre a bit more seriously. Uh, whereas Inscription is, is like I said this on stream, but I, I don't know, people don't agree with me. I, I don't think that Inscription is uh, good as a deck building game. It's a good deck building game, but it's more a good um, kind of like narrative driven game. It's more of a, it's almost like, a, a, you know, it's got cards in it, but it's more of a point and click adventure. It's like it's closer to something like Strange Horticulture in that, like, yes, you're playing cards to progress it, but you're not there for the cards so much as you're there for the story. Like the card gameplay is there and it's good and it's a good deck building game, but I wouldn't recommend it based on its strength of playing cards. I would recommend it on its strength of uh, delivering a very original story and a very original narrative. Um, it's it's just, it's, it's a really difficult one to explain. And I guess I can't explain exactly why I don't hold it as high as other people do, but I really enjoyed it. I just like, I wouldn't, I guess the thing is like, I wouldn't come back to Inscription for its card play. Like I wouldn't come back to it for its deck building mechanics. I enjoy it. I enjoy those deck building mechanics, but I, I recommend it based on its story. And since I've already played that story, um, I, I guess I, I don't have as much like drive to come back to it. I don't have as much motivation to come back to it as much as I do something like Vault of the Void, where they've they've really looked at the format of deck building as a genre and, and tried to innovate on it and tried to make it as as like 
good as possible. Um, I think that, um, yeah, that's that's basically it. Like, I, I, I really don't want this to come across as like, I don't like Inscription or even I don't like it as much as other games. It's a really good game. I just, I have different feelings about it than others, I think. Um, I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't read to me as being good because it's a deck building game. But either way, it's really excellent. Definitely recommend it. I just, you know, like that's, I, if I was gonna have one card game on my list, and I guess based on my own argument, it should be on that list because I'm not really considering it a card game. It, it's just like, if I was gonna pick 10, Inscription couldn't be on there. I like some of these other games more, but uh, it's still a really excellent game. Um, I wanted to mention Gloomwood here somewhere. I've been playing a lot of immersive sims this year and Gloomwood is is definitely an immersive sim and it's very good, uh, but it's also super early. Um, Gloomwood is just like amazing um, and it's doing a lot to kind of uh, innovate on the immersive sim and definitely the, uh, the, the, the main de dev has a lot of love for the genre and they're, they're doing some amazing stuff with Gloomwood, but the game is not even close to finished and it's, it's a game I want to come back to. Um, I just don't know if it, it's um, like, you know, at its current state. I can't say that I would like come back and play it more than say some of the other ones I mentioned on my 10 list. Um, so hence it's in my my honorable mentions. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's excellent and, and definitely go check it out. Um, also should be on here maybe uh, as an honorable mention, though I haven't played it, is a con Control Alt Ego uh, in terms of immersive sims. I haven't played it yet, but I know what's good. I've heard endless good things about it. Um, so, you know, I, I guess, uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know if you can consider Adaka an immersive sim. I suppose that I think uh, that Adaka deserves to be on the list, maybe more than Gloomwood and uh, or Control Alt Ego. Although I haven't played Control Alt Ego, that's why it's not on my list. But uh, I would consider Adaka to be more complete, and uh, you know I, I enjoyed it more for for longer. So, but uh, that's only because Gloomwood isn't. It's just not there yet. It's it needs it needs the maybe the second half of its story. Um, but it was it was it, it what is there is excellent. So, um, Soul Ash. I played I played a few traditional roguelikes this year, although not maybe not as many as, as people would have uh, appreciated. But um, you know, Soul Ash was a new entry for us uh, traditional roguelikes this year, and I definitely deserve some some praise. Like it's it it does a lot to shake up the genre. Um, being maybe more of a kind of a survival sim than than anything like it does you know it's 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 almost like a um you know open world survival sandbox in a traditional format which you know i know a lot of these games do but i think a lot of traditional roguelikes very much are, are very driven towards um a goal you know like uh if you look at something i mean not so much like caves of cud but if you look at you know a lot of traditional roguelikes like say uh um dungeoneers i can't never remember that freaking game what's it called I'm gonna have to look it up now hold on a second done dungeon mans Dungeon Mans, like a game like Dungeon Mans is very like kind of focused towards a goal. Like it, it's got a, it's, it does have an open world, but like you're, you're meant to be doing a specific thing. You're supposed to be, you're meant to be heading towards certain dungeons and completing them. And, you know, it's a bit more focused on, uh, like, I, I don't know, it's, it's a bit more pointed. Soul Ash felt a bit more, uh, meandering and a little bit more wandering. Like you, uh, you do have a goal, but like, you're not so much focused on like, getting to the next combat or getting to the next dungeon or or just fighting stuff and, and leveling up as you are like wandering around and and trying to discover you know some blueprints and trying to um you know scrape together some some uh, a level of, of progression it's a bit more i don't know uh, slow it's soul ash is a bit slower and i appreciate that um, and I appreciate that it's also like kind of uncompromising. Like it, it, they definitely, they've decided like, yeah, this is a traditional roguelike and I'm going to make it look like one and feel like one. And I appreciate that. I, I've talked a little bit about other um, games that are trying to be traditional roguelikes, but I think are doing almost too much to look good. And I actually think that's a negative. That's from my own perspective. I think that 
when you uh, kind of add too much fidelity to the traditional roguelike, um, you actually are compromising on the parts that matter when it comes to traditional roguelikes, which are like, you know, the depth of combat, the depth of gameplay. And uh, also, I, I just think that traditional roguelikes are, are, for me personally, they're at their most fun when you can play them a little bit um, fast. But I know that a lot of people would disagree with me. You should be basically considering every turn. I never will do that. I'm, I'm always going to be a subpar traditional roguelike player because I don't do that. But um, yeah, Soul Ash was, was what I, uh, you know, if I was going to have a traditional roguelike on my top 10, and I probably should because of, you know, uh, what I've built. But, um, you know, it didn't end up being on there because I, ultimately I didn't end up enjoying it as much as some of these other games. But I did really enjoy it. Um, I already had a Vampire Survivors like on my list, which is Gunlocked, and I definitely put more time in Gunlocked than I did Bone Razor Minions. But if I was going to put another Survivor like on there, um, I guess it would either be Brotato or Bone Razor Minions. I'm not putting Brotato, Brotato on there because, you know, you probably already know about Brotato. Brotato is great and I love it, um, but I, I wanted, to, I, I like to shed light to some of the lesser knowns and Bone Razor Minions. Uh, I think it did a lot more to take the uh, genre and do something with it, which I think that way, way too many games, too many of the Survivor likes that came out were like, yeah, we're going to take this format and remix it and ch change like two things and offer like three or th four different abilities, but then it's more or less the same. It, it almost felt, if I'm going to be very critical, regurgitated. And, uh, you know, I know it's super negative, but Bone Razor Minions did a lot to uh, not do that. Like it actually tried to change things up a bit. It, it made it made some actual stakes in the turf that uh, made it feel a bit more original and made it feel like not just another survivor like. And I really appreciated that. Um, let me see. Oh, hold on. So Fabled Lands, uh, I'd love to put this on my 10 list. Fabled Lands was a very hard earned victory um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the developer uh, convincing me that I, I should be enjoying Fabled Lands. And it was it was a very hard fought because um, Fabled Lands is, is, is one of those games that you're either going to get it and you're going to enjoy it or you're not. And at first I didn't. And um, the, the developer tried really hard to kind of meet me halfway and say, okay, why not? Can I help? And actually made changes in the game to to try and like, uh, you know, like make it a bit more accessible because Fabled Lands is very much built on the backs of uh, very, uh, I'm gonna say it, archaic game design. Archaic in a good way. Like there are some, there's certain like, there's content and games out there that are almost made not to be accessible. And I know that there are diehard fans of that and I will respect your wishes and, and, and respectfully disagree. Um, but uh, I, I, I still appreciate where Fabled Lands is coming from. It's, like, it's coming from uh, a very distant, at this point, very distant memory of the of ways that games used to be played and i'm not even just talking about video games i'm talking about pen and paper uh games they were just like meant to be cruel and unforgiving and and absolutely t like super demanding uh and demand that the player uh basically work to earn that game earn or earn that success earn that um reward and Fabled Lands is a game that does that for sure. Um, I, I, you know, working with the developer, have we've tried to figure out, um, you know, how how is it? How can we make it a um, little bit less uh, unforgiving in the beginning, or I guess more forgiving in the beginning, just so that the player is not completely alienated in the first 10 seconds of gameplay? And I think that they did a really good job on that. Uh, I know they're working really hard on the DLC, and I plan on coming back to Fabled Lands. And, and doing more gameplay on it. But I also, I recognize um, that Fabled Lands is a game that has so much love put into it. Um, and it really, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people are going to look at it and, and, and just like completely cross it off their list. Um, even after playing it, like if you, you play that game for, you, you could 
very definitely play that game for like an hour or two hours and not get it. You could play that game for like four or five hours and still not get it and think that, wow, this game, this is just not for me. And I get it, I understand. And, um, you know, I, I guess I just want to say it's still, it is a game that's worth it. And it really deserves um, a second it's a second chance for a lot of people to come back and, and try it. The dev has worked really hard to, um, to to make things right and and make it less of, of like just completely unforgiving and it, it really deserves some love. So uh, and that's it. That's uh, you know there's a lot of games on this list, a lot of games that um, you know top 10 um, I don't know in no in no order whatsoever but like 10 games that I played this year that um, are deserving of, of praise from me um, that aren't just the the regulars um, aren't just like Elden Ring and Vampire Survivors you're, gonna, you're hearing about those games non-stop and for good reason they're really good um, if I was gonna be very honest Elden Ring would end def, definitely end up on my list um, I, I Put a lot of hours into that game and it's difficult for me to do that like i tend to just kind of like play a game cover it and then move on there's always things coming out so for a game to hold my attention for more than like 10 or 20 hours is, is you know impressive and i always take note of that it's like wow i'm actually coming back to this but a lot of these other games did that as well so um that's why i'm i'm talking about them and i uh, i feel like there are certain games that are going to be kind of slept on and are going to be passed up and i think that that's a shame i definitely think that um, you should take a look at these games if you haven't already and i also wanted to just like send some love out there to um, a lot of the devs who've worked really hard on these games and released and uh, you know i feel like once you release your game it's really kind of almost demoralizing because it's like okay that's it um, you know, we're done and now we have to just kind of like work on it, you know, on, on like more content and more you know, patches and stuff. But like that release date, I, I can understand is sort of like, oh, you know, now I, I don't really have as much to look forward to. And especially like in, after that first month when like all of you feel like everyone's already covered your game, so they're not going to anymore. Um, I, I really wanted to come back and like do an extra shout out and like, hey, you released your game and I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for working so hard on some of these games because they are super impressive. Um, and, and you know, they've brought me a lot of happiness. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this uh, rather impromptu uh, spotlight. Um, and if you did, definitely hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content like this although not all that much more content like this we'll see but uh anyway uh, i hope you have a happy new year and uh, i hope 2023 uh looks um you know good